I'll go off the other uh, right side. I'm just hoping that. So, just a reminder on your case study, we finished writing the action plan today, so you need to give me some paper, or I already received an email from one student uh, with the problem, the information, and the action plan for analysis and action plan. Okay? So, uh, and you just, I'll ask you for your case studies. If you didn't give it to me, I'll ask you. The deadline is week 13. This is week 11. So after two or three weeks, right? Do you have any questions about that? You're asking about the final. So have you decided your product? You were supposed to decide by today. What's your product? What? Galbi? Galbi is Are you going to change the name if you're selling another company? Yes, okay. What's your product? Uh, what's the deadline for X points? The what? X points. Uh, what's the deadline? Just you need to give me your case study. Uh, Problem, information, analysis, and action points. Okay? That is, deadline is week 13. Friday of week 13. Okay? This is week 11. We'll do another case study later. So just in your own time, you, if you're finished, you can send me an email or give me the paper, it's better. Okay, I asked you, you should have been finished before this class today, right? I asked you to finish the action points for homework. If you didn't finish for today, anyway, you can do it for time. Okay, uh, so, can each group tell me your product for the final? Presentation. Have you, what's your product? Okay, so by next Tuesday, you need to decide what's your product. I don't know. 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 Okay, next group, what did you decide for your product? Oh, we didn't decide. Okay, next Tuesday, what did you decide? I just want to ask you to get a from Korea for Yeah, it could be from. Expansion from any country to your country and decide. But it can be important which is already existing. Yes. Right. Okay, would you like to support Pepero? 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 Yeah. Okay. Hmm? Alright. Another group? Tega. Food, what kind of food? It looks like it's very expensive. Do Indian people want to eat something that looks like meat? Okay, you have to check about that, right? Is that all of the products? All of the groups? Okay, so this is how we should write a script when we're making the questionnaire. First, we develop what topics we're going to ask about. We're talking about uh, qualitative research. Uh, then we, we should limit our list to about five issues. We don't want to make it too long. Then we draft the question. It means make a... It's not a finished question yet, but let's just start writing questions. So for focus groups, we want to write questions that will generate the most amount of information. So there's usually two to five key questions. Okay? Write these questions first because they require the most attention. 
So we use this checklist to check our questions. Can we use technical jargon or lay terms? We have to think about our audience. Will they understand our question well? Is the language informal and simple, easy to understand? Are the questions short and understandable? What information does it ask for? How broad or narrow is the question? Is it related to what we need to know? Is it easy to answer? How would you feel if you were asked to answer? Is the question sensitive? Okay. Make the sentences in logical order. If we are doing some uh, qualitative research, we can have this kind of thing. One strongly agree to five strongly disagree, right? So we can see the percent, this percentage of people strongly disagree, this percentage of people strongly agree. Okay, get some feedback from somebody on your script. Then pilot test, try on your friends or somebody. Pilot test the questionnaire. Okay, and then after your pilot test, you come back to the script. So click on the sample interview. Open the sample interview underneath. Here is an example of an interview. Okay. The interview will last around one hour. It wants to understand customer value and satisfaction driver. So what this is, is it's a business who is interviewing their customer. One to one interview. Why? They want to understand what is making value for the customer. Why is the customer happy with my product? Why is it important to understand that? In this case, it could be B2B interview. I'm selling some electric part for some smartphone. And I go to the smartphone company, and I want to ask them about their satis customer satisfaction. Why is it important to do that? descriptive part, it takes about 20 minutes. So we ask them about the competitive system, the competition, and the customer system. So where are they in relation to the market? So like we did market positioning for Sony, right? And what is their relationship with the customers? Which customers are buying from them? What features affect customer behavior? Functional or non-functional? So then, this is just a the background. Then we can say to them, let's focus now for the rest of the interview on products, the product that we're selling them. Okay? Or the uh, applicable product. So we can ask them just general questions about this product. Who is responsible for the buying processes of this product? What is the buying processes? What is the role of this product on your day-to-day -day activities? Okay, so this is all just in the descriptive part. Then we go down to benefits and attributes. So here we can see the different types of questions. First type of question is direct laddering. When direct means we're asking direct question for specific information. When buying this product, what are the main features that you take into consideration? Why? 
So that's a direct question. They, have, they are telling you the main features that they think about when they're buying your product. Okay? Projected laddering. Do you understand project? This is a projector. It projects the image onto something else. So we ask them to think about other people's, other people's ideas. Projective laddering. Are there any of your colleagues, buyers or sellers that think differently? Which features do they think are important? So we're asking them to imagine they're somebody else. Then we can ask comparative laddering. So we ask them to compare our product against the other companies. So we ask them which are the main competitors? Why do you prefer my product to the other product? Why do you prefer the other product to the other product? So again, they're identifying the features and benefits. Negative laddering. Why would you get rid of somebody selling this product? Why would you stop buying from us? Okay. So uh, then we can ask just to, them to make an open question. Please describe to me a positive relationship that you happen to have with a, with a supplier. What were its main consequences? Okay, so just we can get them to talk more in this area. Right? This is an open, very open question. Open question means that we uh, they can give a very long and detailed answer, or it could be very different. Okay. An example of a closed question, who is responsible for the buying process of XXX? There's only one answer. Who is responsible for buying, buying this product? Maybe it's you, maybe it's somebody else. Okay. So, uh, do you have any questions about this uh, sample the interview? So if you do some primary research for your uh, project, you can get some extra marks, right? So if you could, you could uh, send an internet questionnaire to some people, right? You're not in that country, so it's not easy, so you probably need to use the internet or the telephone. You could do a telephone interview if you find uh, some people in that business. Do a telephone interview with them and ask them some questions. Okay. Another way is emailing. Email, finding out who the people are. Send them an email. Make a questionnaire for the email. We looked at here how to make the questions. How many questions should you have if you send an email questionnaire? Ten thousand questions. Yeah. Just one thousand. Just one thousand questions. Ten questions. Less, you should just have two to five question, main questions, right? People don't have that much time. So just try to limit it to five here. Limit your list to five issues or five questions. Okay? You can make multiple choice. It's easier for people to answer. They have some forms on the internet that you can make a form where they, people have, can you just enter the question and people do the answer. You could make a web like a web blog, web page, right? And people just visit the link and go there and give the answers. Are you familiar with those kinds of things? How did you guys did you guys use any internet yeah. way of doing what did you do? Uh Survey Exact. It's a daily for the Survey Exact. Exact. How does that work? It's actually very complicated. We get extra lessons where they talk about how to make questionnaire because it has a lot of uh, different ways how to ask the questions, and they they can uh, they can choose only one answer or multiply answers. Or okay. I was using SurveyMonkey. So you use SurveyMonkey. Monkey. Okay. Right, so how does that work? It's very simple. Mm -hmm. It's made for everyone. It's it's very easy to make this one. Just you go to a web page and you just say you, start, well, you want to send a questionnaire and they help you. 
Okay, so you go to Survey Monkey and you, it's quite easy, self explanatory. Okay. And it's for free. And it's free, right? So if you want, you can make a questionnaire, then you need to find the contact of the people, uh, relevant people. For example, if you're selling customized furniture, what kind of people would you contact? If you were selling customized furniture, what kind of people would know about that industry? Who buys a lot of furniture or customized furniture? Apart from just normal consumers. Rich people. Wealthy people. But I mean, apart from just normal consumer, I'm talking about professional. What kind of professionals? If I'm selling some hair product, maybe a hairdresser, right? What about customized furniture? Interior designers. Some architects buy, buy the thing, right? So you could just find some interior designers or interior design magazine. People who work at the interior design magazine, they would know about that industry, right? Then you could uh, send them an email. So they, how many percent of people would respond to an email? What do you think? How many emails would you need to send to get a large number of respondents? 10,000 to get maybe five answers. 10,000 emails to get five answers? <laughs> depends, right? So if you, it depends how you address the person in the email, okay? Maybe they're not, if you address them personally with their first name, they can see it's a written email. Also, if you put your student ID, scan your student ID, then they can see you're a student, you're not a business who's looking for information, right? That's important. They might think, I wouldn't do this for a business, they make money from that kind of information, so I would only do that for a student, okay? So if I can prove to them that I'm a student, then they might do that, right? I could ask nicely for, can I call them, right? What about cold calling? Would you do cold calling? Just find the interior designer in the phone book. <laughs> Hello. Hmm? Maybe illegal somewhere. In some countries it could be illegal. It's okay, I think, because you're students, right? You, it's not so bad. If you explain to them your students and uh, just you're doing some survey for your student project, you already usually you already sent an email before you make the phone call, right? But mainly in the email you can ask them if they want, if they could answer the phone. So, as you say, this kind of doing this kind of research makes your study better, right? If you can do that kind of thing, it improves your study. So you can also try and find the secondary research uh, links for your country. So then. Uh, let's continue. Do you have any question about these type of questions that we can ask in an uh, interview? This is more, if you get telephone conversations, you ask these direct laddering or projective laddering kinds of questions. This is just an example, okay? So, questionnaire. So then let's go back to the PPT. Problems of gathering this kind of primary data. It depends on the ability of the researcher. Can we get uh, correct and truthful information? Sometimes people just fill in the survey A A A A A, right? Just very quickly. Don't give that. Especially if you give them some incentive to do the survey. Like they could be win a prize or something. They might just uh, fill in the answers wrong. Uh, we can have some other problems, differences in countries. Uh, can't, we can do calling people in some countries and other people we can't, other countries we can't. Uh, 
Uh, are people unable or unwilling to communicate their opinions? In some countries, people are more open about talking to people, right? I found when I did some research in China, it was quite difficult to get people to talk to me. So it wasn't easy to do a lot, uh, a lot of questionnaires by email or calling people. Just I have to find in China the relationship is important. So my supervisor had to introduce me to his friend or something like that. Then his friend did an interview with me. That kind of way, right? So some countries, they have more uh, unwillingness or inability to communicate. Uh, field surveys, we have to think about uh, how many people, if we do some questionnaire, it has to be a lot of people to make some proper data. Okay? If we translate our questionnaire, some things don't translate between languages, or it doesn't translate well. So we also have this problem. <coughs> so, uh, can people communicate their opinion well? So, it depends on their ability to recognize, first of all, is this product or concept useful or not? Do they understand it? Is it used in the community? Okay, so if I'm doing some new tablet for the washing machine. Do you know the kind of tablet you put into the washing machine? You don't use much in Korea. Like, like Japan, maybe the washing machine is different, right? If I talk to you about that, maybe you have no idea what I'm talking about. You never heard of that before, right? So I have to make sure that you can understand the product. If it's a complex concept, it's going to be difficult to uh, get meaningful opinions and reactions from the people. So, uh, for example, Gerber is a baby food company. Babies can't answer questionnaires or fill out surveys. Okay? So those kind of companies have to try and understand their customers, even though they can't communicate well with their customers. <coughs> so, Mainly, I explained about the different culture in China and Ireland or Denmark. So this can be a big reason for people's unwillingness to respond to surveys. Another issue is the role of the male, for example, in the Middle East. Uh, women, in some countries, women are not allowed to answer the telephone, for example. Uh, <coughs> some People might feel uncomfortable. In some countries, women might feel uncomfortable talking about something, right? In another country, not. So, we can try a different way. Just we have to find a way around. Uh, use not traditional way we're used to or another way. We have to adapt. Like I explained about in China, right? We have to adapt to the culture where we are doing our surveys. Okay? To get around the problem. So, uh, other problems we can have in sampling is the demographic, demographic data, not properly, do you understand demographic data? So if we look on NationMaster, we looked at before, we can see a lot of demographic data. Some of it is from 2002 or 2003, it's very old. Some of it they miss one part of the people or some part, part of part. Okay. So some countries don't have a census. You have a census in Korea. It co comes around to your house and you click the boxes. How many people live here, how old are they, and so on. Okay. So we can have telephone directories which are out of date, population centers uh, not mapped properly. This is mainly in developing countries. Okay. But the, most, uh, the biggest problem in international market research is language. So, uh, there is a problem with translation. Sometimes people will ask me to translate something from Korea to English. But it's not easy to translate the exact meaning, okay? But when you're doing primary research, you spend hours designing your question, writing your question in a specific way, okay? With, and the way you phrased your question is very important. So when you translate that, you want to have it 
in the same way that you want to ask. It's not easy to do that. To translate it. First of all, it's not easy to translate a phrase exactly from one language to another. That's why humor doesn't work that well when it's translated. Jokes don't work that well when they're translated. But then we, we want to do that for this question. It's even more challenging. So we can use these different techniques. First one is back translation. So we translate from English to Korean. Then we translate it back into English. Somebody else translates it back into English. Is it the same meaning or is it completely different? Or it's off, right? If it's the same, I asked one person to translate to Korean, I asked another person to translate from Korean to English. If it's the same, then yes, the translation is fine. But if it's very different, translation is not fine. It's one simple way. Parallel translation, ask two people uh, to translate at the same time. Ask you to translate and ask you to translate. Okay, check. Is it the same? They're the most common ways. Okay. So we have to think about when we're doing internet research, is our internet research biased? Usually there's some bias in the study. We talked about with Hofstede, we said that he just studied the IBM employees. So there's a bias there for middle class workers. The internet also has a bias. 60% of the users are male. The average age is young, 32 years old, so older people don't use the internet that much. So higher than average have college degrees. The income is higher than average. Okay, uses time is 2.5 hours a week. So when we are doing these kind of online surveys, we have to understand, is this our target group? Why are we getting to our target group? What are we selling? Are we selling a uh, traditional cleaning product that just older women use for cleaning? Is the internet a good place to get the information? No, right? All young people use the internet slightly more male, depending on the country, right? But generally more males use the internet. So we can use these kind of things online. We can use online surveys as you talk with Survey Monkey. We can go one step further, we can have an online focus group with chat, chatting, right? Uh, we can make group chats online. Uh, we can track visitors to certain web pages. How many people are visiting this kind of web pages? We can uh, check advertisements, how many people are clicking on the advertisement. We can try to identify our customers. Who is buying online? We get their information. If they buy online, they give us their information. We get uh, email marketing. We can send emails to people. And we can do some embedded research and observational research. It's not as common. So when we want to estimate the demand, we use uh, expert opinion. It's similar for uh, economics. What's going to happen in the future? We can find out what do the experts think. Okay? When we use expert opinion, we can use triangulation. Triangulation means we talk to three experts. We have an expert one here, expert two here, and expert three here. Which, where do their opinions join? Right? So we make some here. This is what the experts think in common. So uh, let's, for example, a consultancy company like McKinsey, they could make a, a report about demand in the car industry for electric cars. You want to sell an electric car, right? There's going to be a lot of experts who have an opinion about how many people are going to be buying electric cars in the future. Okay? So we, we don't just listen to, we could just take McKinsey's report, their respective consultancy agency, and say that's correct. But it's better to get McKinsey's report, somebody else's report, somebody else's report. What's similar between the reports? Or what's about the average? Then we can get an idea of the demand for electric cars. Of course, electric cars, there's going to be a lot of information. The problem is, for your product, there mightn't be that much information. So we need to try and find an expert 
in that area. <clears throat> then we can also use analogy. So if you were studying the financial management, we talked about Disney setting up a theme park in Brazil. Disney use analogy for this. How many customers do they expect to get? They look at Disneyland in Paris. Disneyland in Orlando. How many customers did we get the first year? How quickly did our theme park grow? Okay, that's analogy. So a product develops in much the same way in countries as other countries. Okay, so we, you look at, you're doing Pepero, you're going to look at how did Pepero grow in Japan or in Korea, and we expect that it will have a similar type of path in, in another country. So then we analyze, next step is we analyze the information. We can accept that the information is not perfect, especially the secondary data can be out of date. For primary data, usually the problem is we don't have enough. We didn't get enough, we didn't have time to get enough. So we have to take it with a pinch of salt. Do you understand in English the saying, take it with a pinch of salt? Take it with a pinch of salt means uh, we accept the answer, but we also think to ourselves there could be something wrong. Okay? There might be something wrong. It doesn't really have much meaning to take it with a pinch of salt. I don't know why they made that expression. But they have that expression, right? For example, if you're always gossiping, do you understand gossip? Yes, always gossiping about people and it's not true. You tell me that now she's dating him, right? I take it with a pinch of salt. It means maybe it's true, but I know it might not be 100% true, right? I'm not picking on you, just using for example. Okay. So uh, we should try to have a high level of cultural understanding. So we, have, we can't be too overconfident. We have to consult with the native people. If we're not consulting with the native people, there's some problem. Okay? Especially about defining the problem. To find out that our self-reference criteria is not a problem. So again, if you can, uh, in your project, consult somebody from that country, again, that's extra points. Right? Uh, it's good to have a skeptical attitude. Are you skeptical? Are you skeptical? No. Not skeptical? Yes. What's the opposite of skeptical? No? Is it going, maybe? Hmm? Gullible. Irish and English people are very skeptical. But American people are more trusting. Or gullible. Trusting maybe is not exactly correct. It's gullible, right? So when I went to the United States, I used to tell them something like, uh, Ireland is a very backwards country, we don't have any watches. Right? And they would say like, What? Really? You guys don't have watches in Ireland? Kind of thing, right? Because they're very trusting. They didn't know about Ireland. Some people in the US asked me, Ireland is on the east coast, right? And I said, no, Ireland is a different country, it's in Europe. Ah, oh, I thought it was on the east coast. No, oh, that's Boston, right? So they didn't know about Ireland much, so some people. So I used to tell them, just for a joke, something about Ireland. And they were quite gullible and they understood. But if you're skeptical, you would say, what? That sounds wrong. Irish people must have watches, right? They invented watches 500 years ago, right? Then you're a skeptical person. Are you skeptical or gullible? Skeptical? You said you were gullible? Yes. So if I told you that in Ireland uh, people don't use smartphones, do you believe me? We don't have smartphones. People don't use smartphones. <laughs> Not that cold. <laughs> Just a little bit cold. <laughs> okay. So when we're doing this, we can uh, have Kind of skeptical, a little bit of a skeptical attitude is okay. Right? <clears throat> so, often the company, if we have a lot of money, we can hire the local researcher to help us. But sometimes we, we don't have money to hire the local researcher, right? Uh, 
we have to try and just find some contact or network in that country. So we have some professional marketing researching firms which can help us. If our boss tells us, okay, here's $1,000 or $2,000 or more, uh, pay the fee to the, them to get some information, that's fine. But your boss might tell you, we don't have $1,000 or $2,000 to pay for that. So you have to do that yourself, right? So it depends on the kind of job you're doing. So uh, the decision makers should be involved in the problem definition and field work. So you should make sure your boss is involved when you're defining the problem or doing the field work. Because afterwards, it shouldn't be the case that you come to your boss and your boss says to you, oh, no, 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 that's all wrong. No, the problem is wrong, and you didn't do the research correctly, right? So you have to involve them there, because sometimes people can also change their mind. Your boss might tell you, this is what I want to know, but they're not exactly sure what they want to know. They might change their mind after one month. No, uh, yeah, no, I thought I wanted to know that, but now I want to know something else, right? So they should be involved. The you know, higher up people should be always involved. And be careful of misunderstanding from language and from the cultural barrier. Did you guys have any misunderstanding in Korea because of language? Mm, one billion Culture? of them. Mm. One billion of them at least. Mm. Like what, for example? Uh, for example, for me on Kakao Talk, I didn't know that this emoticons have some special meaning. Mm. So I sent the one which had different meaning than it was supposed to have. And um, what did you send? I don't know. I don't know how to describe this. Describe the wrong one. I would, yeah. say, yes. I would say they are 100% trustworthy, no mm. skepticism at all. Mm. So they don't get irony and okay. stuff like this. And sarcasm. So whatever I say with irony, whatever I say with irony, what should I use irony most of the time, they just think it's true. Yeah. Irony doesn't translate well generally. Or Northern Europe in England, they're more sarcasm. Sarcasm, do you understand sarcasm? You watch The Office UK, they use a lot of sarcasm in that comedy. But if you watch The Office US, they don't use much sarcasm. Because like I said, the people in the US are a little bit more gullible, so they don't understand sarcasm as much. Why? They think you're being serious, right? So you said you had this problem, you yeah. used some irony or sarcasm, and people thought you were serious? Yes, time. every time. Okay, so uh, we can have this kind of misunderstanding in, in communications. Okay. So, in conclusion, market research, we want to provide information to make the correct decision making. We'll talk about later. We're going to talk about adapting our product, right? changing our packaging, doing different things. Okay, uh, deciding whether to enter the market or not. The American company shouldn't have spent millions to sell cakes which are baked in ovens in Japan. Okay? The challenges are understanding and respecting the respondent's culture in surveys, right? Uh, poor secondary market information in countries outside the US or other uh, developing market countries. But for example, India. India is an emerging market, but it has very good information. So it depends on the country. Uh, so the keys of success, we should try to include natives if we can, use some multiple methods, triangulation, that kind of thing, include the decision makers occasionally. Okay. So uh, discuss these questions with your partner.
Basically, we could do marketing research in our own country, but why is it complicated to do marketing research in another country? Because of uh, language and their cultural differences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they have a difficult, difficulty to get the information. Okay. Also, 
also the secondary data might not be good quality like our own country, right? Uh, <coughs> Chang Yong Hun, Jung Shin. Third question. So, what kind of barrier to entry? How is it hard to get the primary data? Why is it hard to get that data internationally? Okay, similar, right? We have to translate, we have to find out do people know about our product? And they understand about our product? And uh, they, are they willing to communicate? How should we approach them? Those kind of problems. So then, just uh, if we look back here at this book, they use the example of L'Oreal here. So uh, they give the example that L'Oreal uh, has their research and development in the local country. First of all, it spends 3.5% of its revenue on R&D, more than its competitors. p and is 2.7. Revlon is 1.7. So we said that the CEO of L'Oreal says that people on different continents have their own needs, habits, dreams, and desires. So one product or one formula does not fit all. So they, we mentioned this geocosmetics where they do their research and development or scientific development research in uh, local countries. Okay? They have one in China, they have one in Japan, okay? they have one in India. Okay? In China they have 300 different uh, cosmetic and hair products developed in China specifically for Chinese products. So, uh, we mentioned the product which was developed in India and spread out into Asia. And because of this, by 2012, L'Oreal has reached 40% of its sales from emerging markets. Okay? So, L'Oreal is also doing some... Uh, the market research is important to them. So they actually have their research and development center in the local markets to make sure that uh, the research is well answered and we can make the right answer to say what kind of product we need or what kind of adaptation we need uh, for that country. <coughs> so do you have any uh, questions about marketing research, international marketing research? Marketing research is a wider topic uh, which you can go into in more detail if you study marketing. Right. This course is international marketing, so we're mainly talking about the complication of doing marketing research in another country. Right. Do you have any questions about that? So just on the web page we have this international awareness survey. So just in the next class, we'll be using the computer room. So we'll be finding, with your group, you'll be finding out the answers to some of these questions. Doing some kind of research, answering these questions for your country. Okay. Things like uh, being independent is valued. You figure out, is that true for your country? Men and women have equal employment opportunities. You'll be finding out uh, this kind of data using the links that we already talked about on the internet. Uh, so, just you can look forward at some of these questions before the next class, but we'll do it during the next class also. So then, uh, let's finish there for today. Have a nice uh, weekend.